So um, here we are, a few blocks away from Wall Street. Is there anyone here who would like to see Wall Street change? Well, I want to sort of perform a little bit what Laura Flanders in encouraged us to do, is to go on a little bit of a magical mystery tour in our heads. How can we imagine a world where Wall Street loses? I want to just take you on a little adventure and show you how not only it can happen, but how it is beginning to happen. Local small business is a huge part of the U.S. economy. This chart here shows the percentage of jobs in our economy. Uh, the top slice is home-based businesses. The next slice is small businesses with under 100 employees. The next slice is 100 to 500 employees, still mostly small businesses. I will tell you those first three slices there are 99.9% .9 locally owned. Now, if it were true that global corporations were so competitive and small businesses losing their competitiveness, we would have seen jobs move from the top to the bottom. And in fact, there has been, over the last 10 years, almost no change whatsoever. So despite the best efforts of the mainstream economy to try to poo-poo and trivialize local small business, they've done pretty well. And the same is true on profit rates. The most recent data released by the United States shows that sole proprietorships which most small businesses either are or start out as, are seven times as profitable as C corporations. And the most recent data from Canada shows that the most profitable companies there have 10 to 20 employees, about 50% more profitable than the least profitable companies, those that are traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So, Given how competitive, how powerful, how profitable local small businesses are, let's see how supportive you are of the sector. By show of hands here, how many people here have bought something locally over the last week? All right. How many people here belong to a local bank or credit union? Okay, those of you who don't have your hands raised, we're beating you up right after this talk. <laughs> now, those of you with pension funds, how many of you have at least 1% of your pension funds in local small business? Who knows? And I know it's close to zero. Folks, you are the most locavorish people in the city of New York, and yet you are systematically over-investing in Fortune 500 companies you distrust and under-investing, not putting a penny, in local small businesses that we're talking about here. Here we are talking about localization, and we are funding the opposition. We are the problem. Now, the reason why we have this problem is a very boring area of law called securities law, passed in the 1930s, that created a situation I call investment apartheid. If you're this guy, the top 1% of income or wealth earners in the country, you are allowed to invest in anything, anytime, no questions asked. If you're in the other 99%, you may only put a penny into local small business if that business has done massive legal disclosure work. 
which can easily cost $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 in lawyer's bills. And what you get is a thick document, 100, 200 pages long, eight-point font, all caps writing. No human being has ever read this document. This is a lawyer welfare program. <laughs> that is why we do not finance local small business. Now, if we could get this apartheid situation fixed, there would be a $30 trillion potential transfer. That's the full amount of money. Now, I think we should actually be transferring half, because I showed you, roughly speaking, half of our economy is local business. So half of our long-term savings of $30 trillion should go to local small business. That works out, by the way, to a $50,000 per capita. That's a lot of money that could support everything we are talking about today. And if you think about it, if we can't figure out how to transfer this capital, we're not going to be able to get localization. In my view, the $15 trillion that we should get and Wall Street gets now is a subsidy. It's a subsidy because a law has gotten out of control. And if we fix that law, we can end Wall Street's free ride. Now, the whole reason we have these securities laws is, we're told, to prevent grandma from buying swampland in Florida. Last week, I was talking in Florida and said that line, and people were unappreciative. <laughs> but, but that is what they say. And, you know, th there's always the fear of the Bernie Madoff out there. But I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and here's what I know. My mother, a grandmother, great-grandmother, 92 years old, living in St. Louis, so I have a little bit of St. Louis background in me, too. I don't want her to buy swampland in Florida, but here's what my mom does every week. She goes to the casino. And when she walks into the casino, do they say, excuse me, Mrs. Schumann, but are you a, an accredited gambler? No. Do they say, um, can you please read this thick document about the risks of playing that slot machine before you start playing? And then sign. That doesn't happen either. So we have two systems of risk management in this country. One system called gambling, where you can lose everything and probably will for nothing, independent of your income. And another system called investing in local small business for the critical future of many generations. We say you can't play and you can go to jail unless you pay a lawyer twenty-five dollars to $100,000. This struck me as fundamentally wrong. So I wrote an article in a journal uh, published by the Federal Reserve in 2009 pro proposing a little bit mischievously a $100 exemption. $100. We should be able to write a $100 check to any business, any co-op, any small bank we want with no lawyers having to paper the way. And my feeling was, look, $100 is no more risky than going to a new restaurant, <laughs> right? And we do that all the time. And that restaurant doesn't have to do $100,000 of disclosure work before we go. You get a bad meal, all right. You learn something. <laughs> so I proposed this, and then some friends of mine did something that I didn't know they were going to do, which is they wrote a rulemaking petition to the Securities and Exchange Commission. This was followed by hundreds and hundreds of letters. And what did the SEC do? Nothing. Well, fast forward two years after that, there is a hearing on Capitol Hill uh, where the Government Operations Committee is grilling the woman whose picture I just showed you, Mary Shapiro, head of the SEC, and saying, Ms. Shapiro, whatever became of that $100 exemption proposal? And she hemmed and hawed and said, oh, we get these ridiculous proposals for reform all the time. You know, maybe we'll convene 
a group to look at this? Well, the committee, at this point, unemployment in the U.S. is 9%. And everyone in this committee knows, knows that the only source of new jobs in the economy are small business. And this committee, you know, including Occupy Wall Street Dems and Tea Party Republicans unanimously said, we are changing the law. And they passed not a $100 exemption, but something I was a little weirded out by, a $10,000 exemption. Well, this went to the Senate. The Senate whittled it back down to $2,000, and this guy signed the so-called Jumpstart Our Businesses Act in April of 2012. And that act, the promise of it was that suddenly it would be a lot cheaper and easier for small businesses to get capital. That was the promise. We were all excited about it. Two years later, here's the report. The SEC refuses to implement the regulations. So they have stood in the way of this law being implemented. And you know, with excuses like the dog ate my homework, can't do it, too many other priorities, Meanwhile, local businesses who are waiting for this capital can't get it. Well, what's happened next is remarkable. Because across the country, states have said, you know what? We are not waiting for you. We are going to move ahead and make it easier for the residents of our state to buy securities from businesses in our state. And so there are now about 12 states that have basically passed local versions of the Jobs Act. States, some on the left, like Washington State and Oregon, some on the right, like Georgia and Kansas. But this change is happening all over the place. By the way, it is not happening in New York. And note to file something to work on in this state. Now, I was still frustrated that there was not the $100 exemption. And about eight months ago, this woman who lives close to me, I live in the state of Maryland, called me and said, I think we should really try to push for the $100 exemption in Maryland. Because what bothered me about the Jobs Act is that it still had a whole lot of legal stuff attached to it. And I wanted a lawyer-free zone a lawyer-free zone with a little bit of money which could really propel grassroots investment. So I said, okay, great. Give me a call and let me know how it goes. Because I, 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 you know, I was not sure she had the capacity to do this. Well, two, three months later, I, she called me again and said, are you ready to testify uh, in the Maryland House and the Maryland Senate? I was, I, was over, I was stunned. She had gotten the bill before both houses, and both houses voted unanimously for it. And this was signed into law by Governor O'Malley. And it shows you what grassroots action can do. We can change the law. And not just the law on the issuance of stock. This guy, Michael Savant, pushed a piece of legislation that just passed two weeks ago in Michigan to create a Michigan stock market. And here's another story that's really exciting, which is it's very difficult in this country for unaccredited investors to put together investment funds. In Nova Scotia, and Nova Scotia is relevant because the securities law in Canada is very similar to that in the United States, in the province of Nova Scotia in 1998, they created a law to make it cheap, easy, possible for unaccredited investors to create their own little revolving loan funds. Well, since then, 50 funds have been created in that province, nearly all of them focused on helping small farmers and local food businesses. Now, Nova Scotia has one million people in. If the United States had as many grassroots revolving loan funds as Nova Scotia, we'd have 1,700. That is where this movement can head. 
This is how we begin to take the money away from Wall Street. We make it easier to issue securities, to trade securities at the local level and create local investment funds and then people start moving their money. What happens when the first trillion dollars moves from Wall Street to Main Street? Well, the prices of securities on Wall Street with less money chasing them drop. They become less valuable. And the prices of local securities with more money chasing them go up. And then all the investment advisors say, gee, there's something to this movement. We better start moving our money. And the next trillion moves and the next trillion and the next trillion. This could be the fastest shift of capital in modern history. And it's about to happen in this country. It's about to happen throughout the world. To me, the lesson in all of this is clear. The goal is not to occupy Wall Street, but to replace it at the local level. Thank you.